thank you for coming to today's presentation. I'm very happy to introduce you to Dr. Sebastian Carter, who is visiting us from Syracuse University, where he's the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository. And his main interests are in qualitative data management, curation, and the integration of data tools into the scholarly workflow. He's been an active contributor to several scholarly uh, open source projects, including Zotero and the Citation Style Language, as well as the founding editor of the emerging author Carpentry. Um, you've heard of data Carpentry, software Carpentry, and he's working on author Carpentry. Um, and he holds a PhD in political science from Northwestern uh, University, and he has been uh, published in many um, social science journals. And um, I also want to just say that I've had a very nice relationship with Sebastian over time. He's done a webinar on restricted data um, for SLA, which is in our repository if you're, inter if you're interested in viewing it. And he's going to talk today about his current research. So welcome to UC, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Amy, for your uh, thanks for having me. So this is a little bit of an experimental talk. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about annotation for transparent inquiry, and I'm going to start kind of very straightforward talking about what is it, how is it motivated, showing you some examples. And then I'm going to do kind of a little whirlwind tour talking a little bit about the technology and principles uh, behind it. So, so those of you interested in the technology uh, will get uh, We'll have some fun, and then we're actually in the process of running some projects to evaluate ATI, and I'll share some very, very, very initial uh, results with this. So that's kind of uh, what, what you're going to get. Um, so the Qualitative Data Repository, where I work, is a relatively recent institution uh, founded in, I think, 2012, online since 2014. And one of the core reasons it was founded was that debates about transparency in research uh, were gaining more and more traction, and qualitative researchers were kind of worried that they were being left out entirely. So qualitative researchers at Syracuse University um, and at Georgetown, where the co-director is from, uh, founded the Qualitative dire uh, Data Repository as a place uh, that would kind of give a home uh, to qualitative data from the social sciences, but also be a place where we innovate about methods of surrounding transparency for qualitative research in the social sciences, and social science is very broadly defined, so the public health, et cetera, people, we claim them as ours. Um, when we talk about transparency in quantitative data, we actually have a very solid model that's broadly accepted. You know, this, it's not easy, there are, uh, there are quirks in it, but essentially, you have a data set you have some computer code. They produce a figure or a table, uh, maybe two, three in your paper. Um, you put your computer code and your data in a data repository. And you have open science. Everyone is happy. Everything is transparent. Uh, great. For qualitative data, when we think about how research uh, works and how it interacts with an article and with the data sources, that's often uh, quite different. So we'll have all these different data sources. We have one or two archival documents, interview, whatever your qualitative data is. And we have some analysis that may be implicit or explicit uh, that underlies a paragraph or even a sentence in our text. So we have this dispersion of the data uh, throughout the text. And we have a very granular data structure. So instead of having one coherent data set in a one matrix form table, we have all this, these different data sources. And our nice, tidy model doesn't work so well anymore. This is how we used to try to solve this. Uh, we took a tiny little footnote at the end of our sentence, and then either we took up half the page to write a really lengthy footnote, uh, or we put it in the end of the book where only the most dedicated um, of uh, readers uh, would find it. There are two problems with this. A, it takes up a lot of space, or no one finds it because it's in the back of the book and it still takes up space. Uh, the other thing is if you think about uh, this model here, it gives you the part in the middle, it gives you the analysis and the text, but it doesn't actually give you the data because it's still uh, just a footnote. Um, so this is how this first looked on QDR when we tried to do this um, on a technical level. Um, we would have a text, you see, 
uh, the footnote uh, there. And then if you click on it, and I think I have this open, and I practice uh, converting my display settings so that I could switch to my browser. Excellent. Um, some time to load. Um, so you see here the text, and then if I scroll to a footnote, I can click on it, and this will fold out, and then I can click further on this, and this takes me to the data source, which is, I think, a letter that JFK, or speech that JFK gave on the campaign uh, trail. Uh, so functionally, this is actually quite cool. It works very nicely. Uh, but there is a number of problems. The biggest problem is that you'll have noticed that the entire text of the article or book chapter in this case sits on our repository. That, of course, is not a viable model unless we convert all of scholarly publishing to open access, which I would love to do, but probably not going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, the second problem is that the under, that, that is kind of a home-baked solution. So, uh, if those of you who do web development would see the code of you, you would uh, faint and scream. It's like the most ugly PHP hack uh, that, you'd have, that you've ever seen. You could probably do this more elegantly, but the problem is still there, that you're essentially doing something that's home-based. If I'm going to say QDR goes out of business, I want to transfer this to another repository, uh, they need to take over our technology, and it's a big, giant mess. And we don't want to uh, deal with that either. So we have both this problem. We have the copyright issue that we can solve without uh, revolution, I think, scholarly publishing. And we have the technology the issue that isn't really uh, solvable. So we went back to the drawing board. And this is what we came up with. Um, so um, what you see here is an article published with Cambridge University Press on the press's page. This is in PDF form, works in HTML just as well. And then on the side of an article, this is an unedited screenshot, uh, you see an annotation where the author describes what's, uh, what's going on. It's very similar to kind of the footnote or uh, this ATI, the, the active citation thing that I showed you before. The cool thing here is it's actually an overlay. So this entire annotation is served from a third party server using a tool called Hypothesis um, alongside the article but not hosted by Cambridge University Press. So I don't need Cambridge to deal with this. I don't need to convince them this is important. Cambridge is convinced this is important. But um, uh, I can do this remotely. And then uh, we give authors some structure for these. We tell them, you know, you can write up a note, what's important, you can give us an excerpt. So this is actually a quote from that source. Then you can link out to that source. So that's the uh, primary document, again, an archival document from the British National Archives um, that sits on our <coughs> server. And so this is kind of on the front end. You read the article, you have the side along annotations. And then in the back end, uh, you have a regular data deposit. Uh, so you have the metadata that goes along with the data repository, and you have all the individual files that you can also just access as data per, um, per se. And then you see that link there, the annotated article can be viewed on the publisher website. You click that, uh, click that it actually leads you to the annotated ver version. There you can tune out the annotations. This tunes them in, enables the tools, and um, you get to the fully annotated article. And then on the citation, on the, on the annotation back end of this, all the annotations um, are by this uh, service that I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, called Hypothesis. And so they are also all available in a single view. Um, and so you can scroll through all the annotations, not just for that individual project, but also across projects. So if you're interested in, say, doing uh, some s sort of methodological analysis, how do people use evidence, uh, those sorts of things, you could uh, search through them. You see the search bar there. Um, 
So you could look for specific keywords that you may find in there uh, that people use in their analysis and <coughs> look at annotations, not just within, but across different articles as authors produce them. So those are the basics. Let's look at some, some examples. So this is essentially uh, what you just uh, saw, right? So after the Indian troops uh, went to Bangladesh, uh, presented an issue uh, that presented an issue as a barrier to recognition. What are we talking about? It's an article about the Bangladesh liberation uh, war, and he's really interested in figuring out uh, how did the issue of legitimacy figure into the British policy at that time. So a lot of the documents that he looks at are British uh, wires, are British uh, communiques from the embassies, from the foreign uh, secretary. Um, and uh, what we asked him to do is right, start with a note, explain what you're actually doing here. Right? So he provides background. This is a confidential telegram from ambassador to Turkey to the foreign office. Uh, and so what is it? And then this excerpt shows that the Turkish foreign minister both cited the presence of Indian's group as a barrier to recognition and also indicates that this link is what's not immediately apparent. So he explains, OK, what is this document actually doing in my empirical analysis? Uh, here. I'll share the slides, by the way. I'm happy for you to take pictures of them, uh, but you'll get fully usable versions uh, later on. And then again, you can uh, link out to QDR, uh, get to the scanned documents. These are at the UK National Archives, so if you wanted to do this, you could get to them, but you'd have to travel to London. It would be quite uh, the hassle. Um, we have a reasonable amount of time, so I figured I would actually go ahead and go out of the presentation again and um, look at this in context so to give you a better sense. Okay, you see these annotations run along here. They're highlighted in the text. I can click on the sentence that's highlighted, pull up the annotation, and then I can click through here, go to the file landing page, and then, this is still all visible, yes, and then download the actual file, accept my conditions of use, and Once it's downloaded, it will open it. Um, and there's uh, your telegram. So it's a really nice way right, to connect my article to the underlying data. But we feel it's really important that it's not just, just a link between article and data source, which we could probably still do in traditional footnotes, but it also provides this analysis skeleton. That's perhaps a little more detail than you would want to see if you just read the article, if you, you know, tried to get an overview. But it's really important if you want to understand in depth the methods that an author uses. And it's really a good analogy to what we do in quantitative research, right? The number of articles where I go in and go to the data repository and look at the statistical code that an author has produced is relatively small. But those are the articles that I really care about, where I really want to understand what happened analytically, what were they doing, what were their analytic moves. And that's kind of how we think of this. This is not something that we expect every reader to always want to do, and certainly not every single annotation, uh, but this is something that uh, we think the most interested, the most invested readers will want to look at uh, very closely. To look at some other examples, just to uh, showcase the diversity of this. Oops, there I played with. Um, so this is a really ex uh, interesting example of an article uh, in a uh, security studies journal. So this is International Security, the leading journal in uh, security studies, read not just by uh, scholars, but by a fair number of practitioners too. And the article is written by a uh, political scientist and a historian that are area specialists in Iran. And so their overall claim is it's really important for people to understand the Iranian discourse on foreign policy, how they understand their recent history in order to make sense of Iran's behavior 
in uh, nuclear uh, in the nuclear deal negotiations. So what they felt strongly about is um, that we need to understand these sorts of sources. We need to understand Farsi sources. So what they went ahead is, instead of actually providing a lot of access to underlying sources, most of which were copyrighted and they felt they couldn't share, they provided these extended excerpts and then translations of this. Uh, this has a cool dual effect, right? For fellow area specialists, they actually are able to show the care that they took in their translation and that they properly interpreted the text uh, for the majority of their readerships, who doesn't speak Farsi, of course, uh, they're able to provide translations and so uh, provide more of that core information that they want to convey in their article. You know, how are the Iranians talking and thinking about their recent past and uh, their foreign policy um, in terms of, um, uh, and, and, and they're able to do that. Uh, in English and at a length that, of course, even with the generous word counts that a journal like this gives you, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be feasible. The last one is one of my favorite examples. This is social ling linguistics. Um, so they went to a small Scottish fishing village and looked um, at speech pattern, and there you see all those bracketed T's and quotation marks. It's, it's this thing that when you hear British people speak, they swallow their T's, and my British accent is terrible, but like, if you think about something like Bothell, where they don't say the T, that's that glottal T that they're talking about, and they're interested in how does it come about, does it feed through the cities, to the young people, etc. So they talk to different generations. The problem that you have when you're a social, social linguist, though, is that you always have to deal with these transcriptions, but you're really interested in spoken language, right? And so the cool thing that we can do here is um, uh, we can actually um, give, uh, link our examples, so they have, um, they have, you know, talk about their speakers, and then we're able to link out to the actual examples of the speakers. I can, again, go to QDR, it's going to take a little longer to download, but it's totally going to be worth it. And I'll yank up my volume as loudly as I can here so that you can enjoy. This and uh, they were kind of, they stumbled into this, not really knowing what to expect. and so on and so on. You get the idea, and they're giving you also, s uh, s I don't understand them either, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> they understand them, they're, but they are researchers at the University of Glasgow. So um, the point being is though, right, it really brings, uh, what I like about this is it really makes the research so much more vivid because you go from this text where you're like, maybe only a specialist can understand what they're talking about, but maybe not really, even them are really sure, you know, how does the transcription correspond to the actual speech. They are able to actually link that transcription to the sound sample. And the cool thing about linguistic data is, right, these are just, they're just, you know, shooting the breeze. Those conversations are not sensitive, which is why it's really easy to, sh uh, to share the audio recordings, which is something we very rarely get in qualitative data. Most interviews are de-identified, and I can't share the audio, record audio recordings here. That's just, you know, uh, conversation, so that's no problem. Oh, that was. I think I need to extend this. Oops. 
sorry about that. Okay, so these are the examples. I promised you I'd have something for the tech people under the hood. One of the nice things about this is based on an open annotation uh, standard and the structure of what's under the hood. So if you look at if you look at in your browser, you can actually see what hypothesis is sending to your browser, and it's really very very simple, right? Like even those of you who have never seen this, I can explain to you what's going on here. This is the page it's looking at. This is the Farsi article. And then this is the bit that's being annotated. This is the text right in front of it. This is the text right behind it. So this is how it finds uh, where to show the annotation. And then this is the actual text of the annotation. Um, this is how old it is. And then uh, this is who annotated it, and then there's a little bit of additional information and in who can edit the annotation, etc. below it. But you see, it's a very, very simple data format that's underlying all of this, which is very nice for us as a repository because we are really interested in the longevity of this. And if this were like, you know, some complicated thing that we didn't really understand, no one really understands, uh, that would be a giant problem for us in terms of thinking about uh, where does this live in the 10 years? How does this work in 10 years? By having this be based on something very simple, we're much more confident about that. We're even more confident about this uh, because this is based on an accepted standard. So the W3C is kind of the governing body of the web standard. So if you know uh, what is official HTML, what is good HTML is defined by W3C, how are videos played on the web defined by the W3C. Uh, web annotations since uh, early last year are an accepted standard, which means several different applications implement them, which is one of the conditions to get accepted as a web standard, plus it's all codified. Uh, the cool thing about this is, if Hypothesis goes out of business, they're a nonprofit, but if they stop existing, other people can take on their work. It's not just standard compliant, their current work is also uh, open licenses, the free BSD license is about as permissive a license as you can find in open source software, so anyone can take their code, fork it, run with it. And uh, so we have very strong, uh, we have a lot of confidence that even if the individual players are around 10, 50 years down the road, um, the technology uh, is viable 10, 50 years uh, down the road. So we are going to be able to show these annotations one way or the other. Um, and that's, you know, if we think about data as a repository, that's really uh, our core concern. So that was my little excursion into tech. If uh, we have time in the end, people are interested in talking about it, I can talk more about how hypothesis work and work uh, and use it. It's a great tool that's incredibly flexible. That's the other nice thing. It wasn't built for this. It was built uh, more for you know collaborative annotation on the web, uh, so we can talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So uh, we s we developed that, but we didn't really know how well was this going to work, how were scholars uh, going to take it up. We had some general ideas, right? Because this talk about linking text to underlying data sources and qualitative research it's not that new. That goes back to um, some talk in the 2000s, certainly more talk early 2010. So this isn't entirely new. People had talked about this, but we wanted to see how do people interact with the technology on reading? How does that shape how people read? How does it shape how people write? What are authors' expectations? All those sorts of things. Uh, so we were able to get a fairly generous grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and set up uh, kind of a nice evaluation project where we had one group of people annotate article that they had recently published and then brought in for every article, uh, brought in a uh, junior, uh, uh, early career researcher, graduate student, postdoc, um, uh, to evaluate that article once um, before seeing the annotations, and then kind of tell us where would you expect to see annotations, and then turn, in the, uh, turn on the annotations, read the same thing again, and say, how does that match? with what you expected, how does the annotation affect how you view the article, how does the annotation affect uh, your uh, trust in the empirical claims in that article, that sort of thing, right? So really, the, does this work to bolster our belief 
that this is based on sound scholarship. And we also were really interested how well was the technology going to work, uh, how are publishers going to react to having that sort of content overlaid on their site. Remember, Hypothesis was a third party service, so uh, the press uh, doesn't actually have control of the content that's being displayed on their uh, on over their site, which is you know technologically possible, but as a data repository, we really have no interest in uh, in annoying the press. So we were really interested in how do they see this, what are their view about it, and so we collaborated with Cambridge University Press in this. They also helped us identify articles in our field, kind of political science, sociology. They're one of the uh, most important uh, publishers around. Um, uh, at qdr.org ATI slash ATI models, you can see nine, I think, current, pro the current uh, published projects. They're also the, uh, one of the nice things that CFP did for us is they undated all the articles until next March, so they're uh, all open. Second phase is something we've just started. Uh, so we're going to run the exact same process again, scholars, uh, reviewers, but this time we actually ran a competition, had people apply with paper proposals of papers that they're currently writing on and then writing for a November workshop. And so we just uh, finished that and um, we're going to again have authors keep a logbook, they fill out a survey, how long it took them, etc. So I promised some very preliminary results. So the uh, biggest question is, you know, how much work is that? Uh, and uh, good, you know, big range, but what we found is it averages at about uh, 20 hours. We got, I think, anything from 10 to 40, but the, it clusters around uh, 20 hours, which uh, means, you know, this is not trivial. Uh, it takes serious time, you know, that's about two work days or so, um, but it's also not that much more uh, than you would take for a very thoroughly reported quantitative data paper where you need to comment your code and clean up your data and you know name your variables, uh, those sorts of things. We also got a fair number of reports back from the authors in the survey. They were like, uh, well, had I known I was going to do this, I could have done some organization differently. It's still going to be work, right? You're not going to get this to zero, but you can probably shave a bunch of hours off there if people uh, do this earlier on, which is part of the reason why we're running the second trial. I was very curious, so we asked them how difficult they found a certain number of things. And this is uh, actually the two most difficult categories uh, they found, and I was very curious about this because the thing that they found hardest was actually not writing any of this stuff, but choosing what they're going to annotate and where, where they're going to put annotations over and what to excerpt. So the choice is actually one of the hardest things. Um, but they're probably right about that, because what we find in how reviewers reacted to that, uh, there was a lot of, well, why did you annotate this and not this? Uh, which is, is tricky, because right, if you think back of, to the first slide, the analogy to quantitative methods, what they're able to do is actually exhaustive. Right? Uh, my computer code and my data and quantitative model gives me the entire table. There's no question, why did you, you know, produce this table and not that table. No, you produ produce all the tables. Whereas this, there's still a more subjective notion in there. And so thinking hard about what do you annotate and what you don't is actually really important. So they were right to do this, uh, but we were kind of surprised to find this. Whereas, uh, you know, creating notes on data analysis, that was kind of, they still found it relatively hard, uh, but that was kind of where we would, ex would have expected people to say, okay, this was really difficult because I needed to remember why did I use this source and what does it do, and that's a lot of work. Um, we actually found that the match between what reviewers told us, you know, what they were expecting to see and what they were actually seeing is not super strong. So uh, kind of the what should be annotated and what is annotated, well, or what is expected to be annotated and what is annotated uh, isn't um, matching very well. And uh, that's interesting, right, because that does create potential problems. For us, what we think it means uh, is that we need to um, put the rationale of the authors of what they annotated uh, front and center. So we actually ask them to, as part of the metadata write up, what was the logic of annotation that we call it? So why did you annotate 
certain things and don't annotate others. And that is going to be incredibly important for how the article is read and perceived. And their annotations need to not necessarily meet everyone's expectations, but they need to fulfill the promise that they set out to do. So that's kind of our big lesson. Found huge variance in how much people wanted to annotate their articles. We had some articles uh, that were covered in yellow, and you know every second sentence was annotated, every citation. We felt that was probably too much; it was overkill. Uh, we had some articles where we had six annotations spread out. We felt that was probably on the low end because it, at this point you can just put it in a footnote. Um, so a lot of the pieces that work best, like some of the ones that I showed you, are somewhere between 10 and 25 annotations spread throughout the articles. And uh, those also got the best comments uh, from reviewers. Um, the annotations were used very differently. As you saw even in my example, some of them uh, focused um, you know, more on giving access to, say, the, the audio recording. Some of them were really heavily focused on the analytic notes. We worked with a number of people from anthropology who were really more interested in kind of uh, the reflective process that the annotation allowed them so to kind of take a step back and think critically about the role in their research and maybe even uh, surface some of the flaws and the tension in their research. Uh, I think that's quite interesting, right? Because that also reflects the different epistemologies that underlie different research positions where uh, some uh, fields are more, you know, these are the facts I'm going to establish. Uh, a, a empirical records and other fields are more okay, I'm going to try to understand what is going on and, and uh, put myself into the position of my participants which is a much more fraught enterprise and so this diversity we see actually as a, as a strength and as a flexibility of the tool but it was really interesting uh, unsurprisingly but lots of concern about incentives scholars don't get we pay them uh, um, so they were happy to do it um, but Usually they don't get paid for this type of thing. Um, and there's a lot of concern about incentives and uh, that's very rational and, and very real, right? You don't, you're not gonna get tenure based on the quality of your annotations. And uh, we wanna change the incentive structure in, in science and you know, give people more credit for their data, but it's probably gonna be slower moving uh, than we wanted to and for junior faculty, there are costs involved in this, uh, right? And, and it's a difficult task, right? So why are people going to do this? I think the biggest incentive is really going to be that it allows them to show off their work and be more impressive. And, in the, and there is some indication from data sharing literature, more widely speaking, and that it does raise your citation count uh, because people are more convinced, and plus they have more things that they can point to. But it's still on shaky ground, and that's going to remain, as with all data sharing, the central challenge is to show people uh, this is worth doing. Um, which is too bad, because at the, you know, uh, if you talk to the people, they all think it's worth doing. They just say, like, well, it's worth doing, but I have, you know, a, f a family and tenure to get, uh, <laughs> and that's more worth doing. Uh, so it's a struggle. Um, and you know, reduce the workload as much as possible, create incentives, but, but it's a hard problem to solve. Uh, one thing that uh, was fun for the information scientists in our team is that the researchers were actually really interested uh, in having the annotations uh, more clearly categorized. Like, what do different annotations do, right? So this annotation maybe just provides a link. This annotation supports a claim. This annotation uh, reflects on the research procedure, all those sorts of things. And there are existing typologies, both for annotations and for citations, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, so there is kind of an uh, existing body of work that we can build on, and uh, that's uh, an exciting field that I think we're looking forward to do more work in. Um, Mention this, we had this, this competition. We got a ton of submissions. We're actually surprised how much we got about 80 people who want uh, to do this from around the world. We just selected uh, 18 projects uh, that we're gonna be able to convene in November in New York. Um, and it's a really kind of incredibly diverse across disciplines, across topics. 
uh, type of group, so we're, we're going to see how well this works, but we're very pleased with with the quality of the proposals we got, and um, then uh, see how that plays out. And uh, that's it from my side. Um, I'm happy to take questions about really any aspect of that, and if we have more time, I'll show you how we can play around with the hypothesis to some because it's cool beyond ATI. But first of all, I'd like to talk about ATI, of course. I really appreciated some of the different examples, uh, like from anthropology. A lot of the ones you showed are from through archival documents or publicly available or copyrighted published things. A lot of the work that I do and consult on is uh, is data that would be hard to put in a repository because it's interview data, it's personally identifiable. And that, can you talk a little bit more about so your anthropology example gave a where you, you would describe sort of your reflections, not necessarily the raw data, but some of the ways this tool might be used for data that, um, where you can't put the whole data up in a repository, uh, and yet how you might use this tool. Yes. Um. So one of the things that helps with um, uh, that helps with that question is the ability to use excerpts because we typically have permissions to use excerpts of interviews. So this isn't from anthropology. The reason I'm not showing any anthropology is uh, that for technical reasons we were able to publish all the Cambridge University uh, papers but not the other papers and the anthro papers were all in Sage and Springer and so we just don't, I don't have them up yet which is why I, uh, I'm showing you um, other things, this, so this was a um, researcher doing qualitative research in Russia, and uh, he didn't have permission to share uh, full interviews. Uh, but what he was able to do is, let me get the context of the quote here up. Um, right, so there's a shorter quote in the article, but then he is able to uh, provide a little bit of context for the quote, uh, the interview segment in the original and the translation. Um, so uh, that's uh, one of the things that we're actually quite excited about is that you can go find this, this hybrid place, kind of go a little bit beyond what you would uh, be able to sh uh, share in a journal article simply for space uh, reasons and produce the original language. So really, as, as uh, someone who's done uh, field work abroad, I, dislike the fact of having translations in articles. Um, uh, but, you know, we typically can't share full transcripts of a lot of sensitive interviews. So, so that's a, a nice way of doing that. And we found the anthropologists, a number of them did, did some version of that. about in our last slide the categories of citation or of analytic notes um, what are they as of right now what do they include um, so within an annotation we have I think this one has almost everything that we offer so we have the analytic note we have an excerpt we have the translation uh, we have the full citation and then we have the link to the data in the data repository and so we give them to that as uh, we give that to them as a structure and no one complained that they needed anything else um, so what we are thinking about is less, you know, what else do we need within an annotation and more can we categorize uh, the function of an annotation as a whole um, so that we would have some annotations that are data access oriented, some annotations that are analytically oriented, those sorts of things. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, currently we don't do that at all, uh, but there is a tagging system built into a hypothesis that would allow us to do this uh, in a very straightforward way with the existing technology, but you want to get it right, right? And there's, again, this trade-off to just use existing ontologies, which may have limitations about what people want to use, or do you come up with your own, but then you have, you know, created the 101st standard of doing something. So, so some tension and some thinking that needs to go into that, but, but I think there is some cool work to be done on that. Yeah, so I work in natural language processing of um, NLP, and the uh, reason that I came to this talk was this sounded like sort of an interesting direction for annotating text in terms of not really, you know, scholarly 
well, possibly scholarly text, but you know, text as uh, as data mm -hmm. for examining questions about language. Uh, I was curious if you know of anyone who's doing that kind of thing with this work. Yes. Um, so hypothesis is being used for some of this sort of thing, um, and in different ways. So. The closest I saw was a group that actually sent us a proposal uh, for our project that had already done some work with hypothesis where they annotated a chat transcript for health bots, so bots that you know uh, you chat with your health insurance or something about trouble you have, but they were automated, and kind of they analyzed that annotation uh, using, using hypothesis on a relatively large corpus of text, so that's still manual coding. And there's a couple of projects that do that. I know of some automated coding using hypothesis, but that's usually not interested in the language processing, but rather into identifying certain elements. So there's a group in San Diego that runs bots over uh, life science articles that identify research objects. So if they use the certain mouse model or those sorts of things, and those have ID numbers, so the bot recognizes that, and then links it to the authoritative record of that thing. So that's not language processing, but the, annota uh, the annotation of large, large set, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the annotation of large texts is absolutely being done with that tool, of course. Uh, cool. The other thing, actually, and they built that, they use the custom version of, of this uh, when the Panama Papers came out, uh, right? This was this large data dump from the um, law firm in, in Panama, where you know lots of international celebrities uh, were involved, and a consortium of journalists got access to that. Uh, so they built themselves. Uh, they didn't use the centralized and unencrypted hypothesis server. But they built themselves a local copy of the server. Again, it's open source. Uh, so that's relatively easy to do, and then use uh, use that to annotate these giant corpora of I don't know. It was like hundred thousand pages or so total of, of documents uh, to help each other understand what was going on. So that might be an interesting one. Um, I was thinking about the, the copyright implications. Uh, if you have an article and you're putting in a footnote, you're not going to have to ask for permission. You use this tool, you're going to use a significant excerpt or uh, reproduce a complete document. Uh, how did you, how would you work with getting the permissions for this or training the author to get the permissions needed to, to, to do this? Uh, so the excerpt lengths we uh, keep easily under fair use threshold, uh, right? If you excerpt, the, the excerpts are never even close to, you know, commonly used, and then say 10% or so. This is always way yeah, that's, below. That's a, that's a myth. I know it's a myth, but it's, you know. Uh, it's a, if it's at the heart of the, that's, if it's the heart of the document, uh, this is the most important line in that document. It would also uh, perhaps be an issue. But I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, especially there were a couple of uh, Xeroxes of, of or a, a reproductions of, of, of actual documents that were in there. The author would have gotten permission? We would have looked at that. The Xeroxes that you saw were from the UK National Archives, so they're government documents. We checked it, we checked at the archive, and they were like, uh, you can do that. Uh, these aren't under copyright because government documents, UK has similar rights than the US, but the archive was okay with it. And we pay attention to that. If, uh, typically, uh, where, where we have copyrighted documents, uh, we just use excerpts that we are very comfortable with the fair, uh, fair use exemption uh, under and don't put them in the repository as a whole. If we feel they're in Chico, we can try to get copyright because it's often a large number and they're often from different sources, at least in qualitative research. It's typically not feasible uh, mm -hmm. to do that, but um, we try if we felt we have to, but yeah, we pay close attention to the copyright, and that's kind of one of the unique things of doing qualitative data, completely unrelated to the annotations, really, but uh, that that you have to deal with copyright, which you don't really have to do uh, with, uh, with quantitative data, because it's not really copyrightable in most instances. And so, yeah, we talk a lot with our copyright library. Um, 
I want to ask you a, a two, two questions about purpose and uh, content. Um, this is a, a developing, you're developing an index. And how do you, uh, what's the process then for gathering the content? And will it be selected? Um, well, the process of co uh, collecting the content is up to the author, right? Like this is, our thinking on this is really that authors typically do a lot of this work already as they write up their article, but they do it invisibly, right? And we want to make that visible, which is really what you know transparency is about, right? Making the invisible visible. So the selection is essentially done by the author. We give them pointers, so we have suggestions about uh, this may, may make particular sense to annotate things that are really important, that are really controversial, that are really hard to get to. Uh, but in the end, the selection itself is done by the author. So that's in terms of the, indivi of the individual annotations on an article. On who uh, gets to do this, anyone who wants to, just like who gets to publish the data as a supplement to their article. And how will you market that? I mean, how are you going to go about getting the actual uh, sign-on from the author? Are you, will you work through institutional repositories? Are you um, hoping to be a repository of repositories? Or? We'll work with whoever wants to give us data. So uh, various venues, right? Like any, uh, any domain repositories. Uh, one place, because this is so closely tied to the text, one place uh, to go is obviously the journals themselves. Uh, so both the presses and the journal editors who are interested in doing and supporting qualitative uh, transparency for uh, their articles, I think are gonna be a principal driver of that. Uh, but then, you know, uh, we are working with data librarians who have uh, patrons who are interested in supporting that. Uh, we're talking to researchers themselves, right? So QDR is a researcher-driven repository. Um, the directors all have active research uh, careers. So uh, kind of we, we take them wherever we can find them is, is uh, the answer. Are we going to try to be a repository? repositories? Um, Probably not, I would say. So probably in most cases, I would say uh, you either put your data in the main repository or an institutional repository. Although I think there is some room for, as, as IR speak up, their data holdings, as you know, seems to be the trend. There is some room for, uh, for innovation there where you could have cross-held copies between the domain and the IR or the domain repository. Uh, does the curation and then uh, both IR and the main repository hold copies that are then marked as equivalent in the metadata, something like that. I don't think anyone is doing that yet, but I think it, it may be worth exploring to kind of address the concerns of IRs that don't want to make essentially the same mistake that libraries made with scholarship and give all the stuff away to, uh, to foreign entities who hold it then. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, no one knows yet, but I think it's something that we'll, we'll be talking about in the next uh, one through 10 years. Uh, a comment, please, and a question. Yeah. A comment, I really appreciated uh, what you said about incentives. I think that's probably a huge part of figuring out how to entice folks to spend the time to do this. I, I, I appreciated those comments. My question is probably more my curiosity. I was really taken by your point about um, expectations when you have the postdocs and the grad students uh, doing the annotations. If you have time just to talk a little bit more about what was expected and wasn't delivered, what, what do people want and didn't get, that sort of thing? I unfortunately don't have a good, uh, you know, abstract line of, you know, there was like a general trend in one direction. It was more like uh, which sentences, even like which individual claims were considered, you know, this is like something that's really crucial, or this is something that's controversial, or this is something that's important, different between who, uh, the readers and, and the writers. Uh, and which so, isn't surprising, right? Which, I don't know if it's surprising or not. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I find it surprising or not yet. Uh, but, um, so, so yeah, so that was, uh, it was really the small bits. And in some cases, this was just uh, the amount of annotations. Some people expected way more, and some people expected way fewer. Uh, 
Uh, so it wasn't so that, necessarily about what was annotated, or, or it was. It well. was in some cases too, but it was like not like a general, you know, I expected you to annotate uh, interview excerpts, but you, in, uh, you annotated your literature review, but it was more like, um, I expected you to annotate this sentence, uh, and you annotated that sentence, um, more of that. Although I think a lot of people uh, said uh, the reviewers were expecting a little bit more annotations in the uh, literature review and theory part, kind of justifying the setup of the article, which I think is interesting um, mm -hmm. and maybe worth exploring because that's not a good match for the data analogy, but may actually be useful to think more critically about being uh, transparent about how we set up our article because there's a lot of fudging in the theory section of social science article where we claim you know, to be the first, where we claim, make all sorts of claims and hand waving. Uh, so, so that may be worth exploring, but we haven't done any work on that. Thank you. I have a question. You commented about you have a, a copyright librarian who's helping not manage some of those aspects. One of the things is I've published qualitative research across a lot of different journals and disciplines is there's also a lot of different ideas about the ethics of what can be published and what you would use as evidence and what shouldn't be. Um, I'm thinking, for example, I know some journals won't publish tables that delineate demographics by individual participants and others will. Do you have um, also sort of an, like, are you developing an ethical guideline about what would or wouldn't be included or are you leaving it up to the journals or um, kind of thinking about those um, issues? We have an ethical baseline. Uh, so, uh, right, we make sure that people obviously have IRBs and we check with uh, people who've t uh, that, that we look at people's informed consent and make sure that that doesn't exclude any data sharing. So, uh, we uh, kind of do a baseline check on is this blatantly unethical, and if it is, uh, we say no. Uh, but I don't think we want to be in the business of uh, negotiating the kind of details of uh, ethics. I think I would want to leave that to the researchers and their journals because while we're you know social science focused, it's still a fairly wide field. We can you know navigate uh, the more minute uh, differences in ethical uh, standards between disciplines. Maybe the smell of the lunch is starting to focus people somewhere. But thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank for you. This is a great